start by looking at the warm up. So let me share the screen. So another warm up and yeah, whole range. Some people are just killing it and some people are getting killed. <laughs> um, all right, so an exogenous ligand. And again, exogenous meaning something that came from outside of your body, usually some pharmacological, you know, thing like I'd, you know, either a, you know, pharmacological drug or a recreational drug or something you're getting from outside your body, but has a shape and chemical structure that can mimic the naturally occurring ligands. So they basically get into the receptor. If they bind and they block it without activating it, that's, again, most people got an antagonist. What would we call it if it binds it and activates it? Agonist. Agonist. That'd be an agonist. So good. Again, we're going to be spending more time on this right um, in a few moments, talking about what exactly happens when a ligand binds a receptor and what are all the steps involved there. Um, which of the following cell-to-cell -cell attachments electrically connects? Again, these are the gap junctions. We'll see them in the nervous system. We'll see them in muscles. Um, and tight junctions, those are the ones that are like the Ziplocs. Those are the ones that don't let things squeeze between cells. Like we saw that in those epithelial sheets where you're trying to tightly control what gets from one side to another. Um, desmosomes were more like those rivets and stuff to really just hold cells tightly, keep them from ripping apart. Um, Drugs like caffeine, morphine, LSD, THC, all these, all these things. Again, they can bind receptors and affect the cell behavior. And the reason they can do that is because they, you know, they, they trick the receptor into binding because they look a lot like the native, the naturally occurring ligand. Um, Yeah, they don't. There are things that work, like that by disrupting cell membranes. There are some, some anesthetics, for instance, that seem to work by actually getting into the cell membranes and just affecting the way the different channels and things work. But most of the stuff, the things that we've been talking about, you know, that act as, I said specifically, act as exogenous ligands, those are going to work by binding receptors and then having some function. Um, all that are true regarding secondary active transport can use as energy stored in concentration gradient, does not use ATP directly. So this is the difference. This would be primary active if it was using ATP directly. Secondary is using energy stored in concentration gradients. Um, you know, it can be used to move from low to high because it's active. And it does require specialized membrane proteins. Remember, we had that symport that carried in glucose along with sodium when we looked at that example of transport. Um, a question? No. All right. Um, give at least four different roles that are played by proteins. Um, different people got different points on this. Um, let me just kind of go over that one more time. Since it's kind of at the core of what we've just been talking about. You know, again, what are the roles that membrane proteins play? Transport. So there's transport. And there's lots of different versions of things that do transport. We saw the channels, and channels might be gated. 
and there's carriers and and we have the couple transport like this in the sim ports and the anti ports. Um, if I'm asking you for like four different roles and you just gave me all of the things that are all different versions of transport, that wouldn't be enough. You know, I, I want to have something more, you know, it's, it would be like, tell me all the different kinds of pets that people usually own, or tell me at least four different kinds of pets. And you said, well, people have St. Bernard's and they have golden doodles and they have beagles and it's like, no, they have dogs, they have cats, they have birds, they have geckos or whatever. So when you're when, when I ask questions, there'll be questions like this on your exam next week. Um, you know, don't you know, try to think about if you're giving me two things that are just two aspects of actually the same answer versus two distinct things. So transport, what other things? Cell identification. Yes, cell ID. We talked about that's important. Your immune system has to be able to recognize, you know, self versus other. And we'll talk about there's different ways you can do that. Some some things that your immune system recognizes are just, um, you know, markers that would never be on a eukaryotic cell that would only be found on, you know, some bacteria or something. But these distinct cell ID markers is kind of like the barcode for your particular body is important as well. Um, what else? Receptors. Attachment. The receptors. So these are the things that can bind ligands, you know, recognize different signaling molecules, and then you know, create some effect in the cell. What's more? Cell to cell attachment. Yeah, cell cell attachment. Yeah, so we talked about the type junctions, the desmosomes, the gap junctions. There are also um, some of these proteins that help anchor just in surrounding surrounding tissue, the matrix of the connective tissues and things. Um, what other things are there? Enzyme functions. This is one that I did not actually say, I think, in our list last class, but actually you should know. So enzymes, if there is some reaction that makes sense to have happen right at the, um, right at the membrane, then it makes sense to anchor that enzyme, that catalyzed yeah. reaction on the membrane. Um, examples would be um, when we look at signal transduction in a little bit, we're going to see this adenyl cyclase and things like that. Enzymes that are catalyzing things that are part of the second messenger pathways that are actually anchored on the membrane. Um, in, in digestion, you know, the final steps of digesting your food are creating individual, you know, monosaccharides and individual amino acids. Those enzymes that do the last steps of digestion are going to be actually anchored on the epithelial cells of your intestine. They're called the um, brush border enzymes. So we're going to see if there are reactions that we want to occur right near the cell. Sometimes the enzymes are actually anchored within the membrane itself. Um, what other things are membranes proteins doing? Cytoskeleton attachment. <laughs> Cytoskeletal attachment. All right, so membrane proteins, important, doing lots of cool stuff. And again, in your kind of laundry list of what they do, make sure you make put enzymes in there because I realized as I was kind of thinking about it um, this weekend that um, I don't think I mentioned enzymes specifically as another important role that membrane proteins are playing. Um, so, all right. What we're gonna do now is continue on and we're gonna 
spend just a few more moments talking about membranes, and then we're going to get into that idea of signal transduction that I introduced last time. So, So there's a couple of cell membrane modifications that um, we should just look at specifically. Um, there's a variety of, in anatomy, you go deeper into this, but in our class, the two main ones we're gonna see, we're gonna see microvilli and cilia. And they're different in how they're put together and they're different in like what their function is. So microvilli are these kind of submicroscopic little folds. Um, they are what we call non-motile. They don't move. And their main purpose is just to kind of increase the surface area of, of the cell, like for absorption, for instance. Right, if you think about like an air filter on your car or for your furnace. It's got all those crazy little folds, right? Because you can get the same amount of surface area in a much more compact, um, compact region. Like supposedly if you smoothed out all of the folds in your small intestine that, you know, or it, you'd get a surface area like the size of a football field. So you get this crazy large surface area to absorb your nutrients but you can pack it all in your belly because you got this crazy folding of all the cells and everything. Um, these, you don't actually see these um, like that under the microscope. Under an electron microscope, you could see that, but under a light microscope, it just kind of looks kind of like fuzzy. So they often call it the brush border. because it looks kind of like the end of a brush. You can tell it's not smooth, but you can't really see the individual folds, so to speak. Um, it's, I've mentioned this, it's anchored with those actin filaments to give it support and structure. Um, you know, so it does have cytoskeletal support to make sure that it keeps right. It's like if you took a piece of cloth and you folded it into little pleats and let go, the pleats would just fall right out. So it needs to have something hold, helping it hold that structure. But again, non-motile, doesn't move, and its function is increasing surface area, typically for absorption. Um, as opposed to cilia. So cilia, they tend to be bigger. You can actually see them as little hairs coming up off of the cell under the light microscope. They are motile, meaning they do move. Um, and they typically sweep things across the cell. Yeah, you know, we're gonna see cilia moving the mucus, you know, along your respiratory epitheliums after it traps dust. We're gonna see cilia sweeping the egg down the fallopian tubes towards the uterus after ovulation. So cilia sweep things along the surface. Um, the cytoskeletal um, structure is very different compared to microvilli. You'd imagine, because they move, it's got to be more complicated. So they have microtubules inside. They're these little things at the base called basal bodies. And then we have microtubules in here. And 
And we have what's called the nine plus two arrangement of microtubules. Um, let me explain this. Let me get on a new page. So, these are supposed to be the cilia. Heck, we have kind of like a central pair of microtubules. If I'm doing a cross section here, I'll see a central pair, and then I'll see nine pairs that go around it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, hold on, I'm trying to make this prettier. So here's a pair, 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 here's a pair. And this is supposed to be the um, you know, this yeah, so we're we're cutting across here. So there's this central thing, and then there's these pairs that go around it, and then you have these special proteins in between that can pull between these microtubules. They're called dynins because they're dynamic. They make things move. Um, the, I'm sorry, can you repeat what that, that last part again, that they, in between? Yeah, so they, in fact, let me show you this right now um, in a better way. I'm going to stop sharing here. All right, this here, this I think is a good way. So this here is a um, Ziploc thing. So imagine this is one side is a microtubule, the other side is another microtubule. They're kind of attached side by side, but you have those little dynins that can actually pull on them differentially. And when you pull on them differentially, what happens is they move. So, Yeah, I'm sh kind of showing how this works here. I'm basically using my fingers to kind of push, pull, or you know, push and pull. Do you see how that works? Just by putting, like, pulling on them one way or the other way, having these two microtubules or these two long things side by side, it causes the overall column to bend one direction or the other. You see, does that make sense what I'm doing here? So that's how that's how those cilia work. You have the microtubules side by side, those little dynin proteins, like grabbing onto the side by side ones and pulling them. And as they pull, it makes the whole thing bend back one way or the other way. So that's how a, and obviously it's gonna take ATP to drive this because this is an active process. So th does that make sense? Um, one of the things I can leave you with from this class, you know, you might, yeah, you, hopefully the other, some of the physiology will be useful, but another thing that's useful, if you do take the top off a Ziploc bag, then you actually have to cut one of the ends. One end has to be able to slide. Um, so this end is normal, this end's cut, then you hold it, then you can entertain, like, you can say, like, hey, come here. And it, you can, like, or you can say, go away. Or, you know, here, come on, come on, come on. And then it comes, you know, so you can play with it. You know, give me a kiss. You know, so you can play around with a top of a Ziploc if you're getting bored or you're trying to, like, entertain somebody who's getting bored. Um, all right. I just have one quick question. So it's because of the microtubules that 
cilia move or it's because of the proteins that the cilia moves? Um, it's them working together. It's the proteins pulling on the microtubules. Okay. Yeah. Um, the one other version of a cilia that is the same thing, but is there's only one version of it, and you've all seen it before. You know, the flagellum. Let me get a better one. A flagellum is like a mic is like a cilia, except it propels the entire cell through space rather than sweeping something along the surface. You know, where do we see those? Sperm. Yes, yeah, sperm. The only place we see those in an adult human is in, in the sperm. Um, it's the same basic microtubule structure that makes the thing wiggle. Um, during development, there actually are flagella that are a little, and they're rotating. They actually have to rotate in the right direction for normal development to um, occur. But in an adult human, the only flagella we see are in the sperm. Okie dokie. Um, so any comments, questions about that stuff? Um, I just have a quick question. Is uh -huh. it the basal um, uh, bodies that uh, help it stay attached, right? Because you said it's open on the bottom. So, so the, the, the open on the bottom was, was when you're making doing the, the trick with the Ziploc bag. Um, um, the, the basal bodies are like the microtubule organizing centers. They're the things, though, that they are kind of constructing and maintaining the microtubules. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, all righty. All right. So what we're going to do now is go deeper into signal transduction. Again, this term signal transduction is referring to there's some signal, typically some ligand binds a receptor. You know, and something happens. Sometimes a ligand binds a receptor and it'll open up an ion channel. Sometimes a ligand binds a receptor and it's going to turn on some protein synthesis. Sometimes a ligand binds a receptor and it's going to activate some enzymes to do something. Um, there's all sorts of things that might happen as a result of a ligand binding a receptor, but something happens. And transduction means kind of translation is how do we go from this moment of a ligand binding receptor to something actually happening that matters in the cell. So that's what we're gonna look at right now. And I introduced it already last week. We talked about the idea of ind indirect versus direct. So I'll just review super briefly. You know, we can have like directly gated channels. You know, if like if this is a cell membrane, you know, I can have, in fact, you know, the example that we're going to see in a, in much more detail later. You know, after your after your first exam, we're going to go deeper into different types of of um, receptors for different kinds of neurotransmitters. But the example, I'll just against nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Yeah. 
there is just one big protein. Whoop. There's one big protein and it has a docking site for acetylcholine. It also has a channel on it that lets cations through. And it's all one package and it's all linked together. So when the acetylcholine binds the receptor, it opens up the channel and lets the sodium come into the cell. So there's no, no extra steps involved. It's just, it's basically, imagine it kind of like a spring activated door and this thing pushes on the little leaf on the thing that activates, you know, releases the spring or something. It's like one shot deal. This is, you know, there's, this is important. There's a, quite a few examples of important um, receptors that work this way. Um, but it's not the most common. More commonly, you got a much more kind of complicated thing going on. So I'm going to show you that now. So for instance, we're going to talk about the muscarinic cholinergic receptors or most of the serotonergic receptors. Most, most of the other receptors are going to be more complicated. So let's take a look. Or the receptors for like insulin or most hormones or... Um, things like that are gonna be more complicated than just something like this. So this is directly gated. What we're gonna talk about now, some more common. Heck, I don't mean to be writing so big. Is what we call second messenger pathways. You know, and typically, you know, featuring what are called G proteins. Um, we'll talk about why G proteins get their name because they bind GTP. They're just, they're special membrane proteins that are associated with receptors. We'll see them in much more detail in just a few moments. Um, second messenger pathways. Um, let me just talk about second messengers. Second messengers are going to be molecules that continue the signal inside the cell. Um, you know, the, the initial message might be insulin or serotonin or adrenaline or whatever the cell binds to, but then there's going to be multiple steps and we're going to end up having the signal continue as a second messenger inside the cell. And these are different molecules. Um, typical second messengers I've mentioned were cyclic AMP. And we've introduced like important nucleotide based uh, molecules, cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP, this is guanosine monophosphate, adenosine monophosphate. Um, the other second messenger that is also super important is just calcium. having calcium levels go up or down in the cell as a result of these second messenger pathways is often um, a critical port, part of signal transduction. So you're gonna, we'll see examples of all of these. So this is kind of setting the stage. Second, they're called second messenger pathways because they're gonna utilize these second messengers inside the cell that continue the message. We're gonna have these special membrane proteins called G proteins that are associated with the receptor. And, and here we go. Let's, um, let's just dig into it. Um, 
you're going to see that a lot of things, I talked about metabolic pathways in the body, you know, having lots and lots of steps to get from the beginning to the end with lots of options along the way. This is another example of that. You know, and we're going to be, before today is out, we're going to be looking at cellular respiration, which is going to be yet another case of getting from point A to getting from the beginning to the end takes about a million complicated convoluted steps. It's just, you know, the way the body is. Um, I suspect it's the result of just kind of evolutionary processes. Like you've got something and then something changes, but it adds on to whatever's there, but it adds some function. So it's not, you know, so every time things kind of keep keep changing and evolving, you've got this kind of kludge of stuff that's already there adding or stuff, new stuff adding the stuff that's already there. And you get these big complicated entangled messes of things that ultimately do what you want, but it's often not quite as straightforward as you wish when you're learning the stuff <laughs> or trying to even understand the stuff. Like there's still so many things about cell physiology that are a mystery where people are actively trying to understand what the heck is going on. How the heck is the cell doing that? Um, okay. I'm going to start by drawing a cell membrane. Um, this is going to be outside the cell. This is inside the cell. Just to kind of give you some context here. Obviously, we're going to need a receptor because the whole point of this is signal transduction. It's we're going to have a receptor. It's gonna be specific to bind some particular ligand. And again, that, that kind of temporary thing that happens, that binding, it binds there, binds at the receptor site. Um, and I want to go from a ligand binding the receptor to something happening in the cell, like opening a channel or turning on an enzyme or something. Um, for these second messenger mediated pathways, there's going to be lots of steps involved. So let us take a look at how this is going to work. So again, we have our receptor. Um, the receptor is associated with what's called a G protein, which is a membrane protein um, that is associated with the receptor. It's, it's actually got three different parts, but it doesn't matter for our... Um, it gets its name because it binds GTP. Um, which ends up getting cleaved when it goes, gets activated and stuff. So G protein. So this is kind of our beginning. When the receptor is just waiting for the ligand, it is sitting there in the membrane along with its G protein, which is ready to go. It's not doing anything yet, but is going to be super important in a few moments. Um, I should also mention, I'm going to describe one typical type of second messenger pathway. Um, and then I will kind of circle back and talk about lots of other options as you know, that you can use along the way in this process. So a very typical second messenger pathway would be this. The ligand comes in and it binds the receptor. And that is going to activate the G protein, 
which then detaches. And we talked about fluid mosaic model. This activated G protein can drift. So now we have our little, maybe I give it a little red thing because it's activated. This activated G protein, which was activated by the binding of the ligand to the receptor is going through. And this activated G protein can do lots of things. Um, a typical thing it might do is turn on an enzyme in the membrane called adenylocyclase. This catalyzes formation of cyclic AMP. So when this activated G protein gets to this adenylocyclase, it turns it on, and that's going to start creating lots of cyclic AMP in the cell. So this is this idea of a second messenger. All right, we're going to continue, but let me just make sure this makes sense. This ligand here, this would be what we'd call like our first messenger. This was the one that came in to start the whole process. You know, it bound the receptor, which activated the G protein. The activated G protein turns on a denylyl cyclase. Adenylocyclase catalyzes the formation of cyclic AMP in the cell. So we now have the second messenger it present. So now, first there was a thing that happened outside the cell, but now we have a messenger that's building up inside the cell. So then what is cyclic AMP going to do? Cyclic AMP is going to continue this process by turning on a protein kinase. Um, so protein kinase A, we're going to see there's other kinds of protein kinases. There's protein kinase um, C that's involved in other second messenger pathways. So the cyclic AMP is activating this protein kinase A. And does that word kinase sound familiar? I mentioned it like in the first, enzyme. it's an enzyme. And what does a kinase do in general? I mentioned kinases. Um, it's a it's an enzyme that moves things. Is that right? It 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 transfers a very particular kind of group. Couple. And we talked. I talked about creatine phosphate, like in the first week or two, is swapping the phosphate group from creatine. I talked how you could have a creatine kinase swap a, a, a phosphate group from an ATP or from a, from a creatine phosphate onto a ATP. Um, kinases in general, we are gonna see lots of kinases in this class. Kinase, this is just enzyme that phosphorylates things. It typically takes an enzyme, and it's an enzyme. It typically takes a phosphate group from something. It might be from an ATP. It might be from a creatine phosphate, and it transfers it and slaps it onto something else. So kinases, we're going to see lots of versions of kinases. When we get to glycolysis in a little bit, the first step in glycolysis is a kinase that phosphorylates the glucose and makes phosphorylated glucose. 
We're going to see kinases coming out the wazoo in this class. Um, kinases are important in cell metabolism. They're important in muscle contraction. They're important in signal transduction. Um, phosphorylating things in general is often a way of controlling things in, in cell physiology. This you know, can often you know, open or close channels. Turn enzymes on or off. If I have some enzyme here that does its job, it might be it doesn't do it unless it has the phosphate group attached. And now it's doing its thing. And then when this is gone, it stops doing its thing. And when you rephosphorylate it, you turn it on again. So often adding a phosphate group to things is like a switch that turns it on or off, whether if it's an enzyme or opens or closes a channel, for instance. So if we come back to this picture here, the cyclic AMP turns on the protein kinase A, you know, this phosphorylates, you know, could be an enzyme or channel or whatever, you know, in, in that process, it could be activating or inactivating enzymes or opening or closing channels. Um, you know, maybe it's useful if I just type this out really explicitly since we, since we uh, are talking about all sorts of stuff. You know, so like, you know, one, like, what what's going on here? Okay. Um, hold on, excuse me for a moment. The, my little magnabbit. Okay, my keyboard, my little keyboard died, so I'm not gonna do this as pretty as I had hoped. Um, so instead, I'm going to write it out more sloppily. You know, ligand binds receptor. That's what's going to start the whole process. Two, this is going to activate the associated G protein. That G protein then goes and typically turns, does something, often turns on some enzyme in the membrane that is gonna um, create second messengers. Turns on, it, it could be like adenylyl cyclase. which makes cyclic AMP, you know, it can turn on others as well and create other kinds of second messengers. Um, for instance, it could turn on phospholipase C, which is ultimately gonna result in the um, increase of calcium in the cell. So G protein, so in either case, we have increase of the second messenger in the cell. Could be cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP, it could be calcium. Um, this typically turns on a protein kinase. Again, protein kinase A, if it's 
cyclic AMP, it's another protein kinase if it's calcium, but it's the same idea. You're turning on an enzyme that phosphorylates things. You know, proteins, you know, can do lots of things, turns enzymes on or off, opens and closes channels. Etc. So you do need to know this process, and we're going to actually go look a little more detail of it as well. So if we come back to this big picture here, you know, I've been talking about how ligands binding a receptor is a temporary thing. So, you know, the ligand comes in, but eventually the ligand's gone, right? Now there's nothing at the receptor. The receptor is just waiting there. Um, but there's still all this cyclic AMP inside. So if there's no message at the receptor, we want to eventually turn off the message inside the cell. So we need to have something that can get rid of that second messenger in the cell so the message doesn't just keep on and on and on. So typically you have an enzyme that breaks down the second messenger. The classic one is PDE, phosphodiesterase. So the phosphodiesterase comes in and it can break down the second messenger and it will eventually, you know, ends the pathway. Stops it from happening. Because you don't want it to just keep going and going and going if there's no, you know, there's nothing tickling the receptor anymore. And what triggers that to happen? Just that the ligand is no longer attached or so it can actually be a number of things we'll talk about to some degree it's just sitting around to um to empty you know to kind of clear the space kind of like if you have an air filter going on in the house and you blow some smoke in the air and it's just going to clear it out at a certain rate so at some level it's just sitting around waiting to stop the pathways once they get started but then we're going to see that you can actually have other pathways um, influencing it and changing the amounts of it. Um, last class, I mentioned how Viagra works um, by modulating the activity of second messenger pathways. So the process by which a guy gets aroused and it leads to vasodilation, kind of you know, erection, you know, the blood vessels to the penis dilate and more blood comes in and the penis swells with blood and there's an erection. That is something that is mediated by a second messenger pathway. Um, it uses cyclic GMP rather than cyclic AMP, but it's the same, same basic story I've told you. Viagra, what is it, sildenafil? Viagra is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. So why would giving somebody a phosphodiesterase inhibitor help some guy with erectile dysfunction? It would prevent the signal from being turned off. Exactly. It prevents the signal from getting turned off. So this, this pathway turns on, it makes the second messenger, the guy gets his erection. And normally you'd have the phosphodiesterase then coming in to, you know, turn off the pathway. But if he's got the Viagra in the system, this is not functioning. We have the second messenger level staying high and the pathway stays on. 
right? So will giving, will taking Viagra help give a guy a hard on? No. No, it's not going to actually create the erection in the first place. You have to have, you know, the normal kind of arousal turn it on in the first place. But once it happens, this is going to keep it from from stopping. It'll it'll start and it will last much longer than it would have otherwise. So th does that make sense? Um, you know, there's a lot, there's a variety of drugs that work at the level of the second messenger pathways rather than just at the receptors as endogenous, exogenous ligands. So we'll see some of that as we go through the semester. Um, so I've just given you this big, crazy, complicated thing. Um, what are the benefits? You know, we had two, two visions. Um, super simple. Oh my God, this is so much easier. It's something binds and something happens. And we have the other nightmare vision of something binds and it's freaking crazy. Um, and you have got to memorize it all. Um, so what are the benefits of using these second messenger pathways? Why do we have these? There's more opportunities for regulation. Yeah, so benefits of second messenger pathways. Would it also be more beneficial because you're using less energy because it's stimulating a secondary messenger without the use of extra ATP in it? No, it's the opposite. You're abusing way more energy. I mean, just the G protein is binding GTP in each of these processes. No, it's way more active. There's so much more going on. Um, but let's let's start with John's thing. So there are you know lots of opportunities for complex control. Um, because there are so many moving parts, you can go in there and you can change how the, um, how the second messenger pathway runs. And in fact, often two second messenger pathways will influence each other. So you might have one second messenger pathway that I've drawn here, but another one that's mediated by calcium that actually is turning on phosphodiesterase and changing the activity of another second messenger pathway. So you can have all these different second messenger pathways actually influencing and modulating each other by affecting these different molecules that affect how, it, how this thing goes, right? Because remember you're, you know, you can have another second messenger pathway turning on, maybe it's turning on this enzyme, which is turning off this second messenger pathway. You know, so this idea of all these different little places to get in there and adjust and have different processes modulating and affecting each other is one of the things you get from this. It also makes it more overwhelming just trying to understand what a cell is doing because lots of things end up influencing other things in ways that you might not have thought in the, in the originally. So, Lots of opportunities for complicated control. And again, like I said, often you'll have two second messenger pathways, maybe one mediated by cyclic AMP and one mediated by calcium actually affect the functionality of the other one. Um, so they're not independent of each other necessarily. It actually gets even more complicated. You can actually have multiple second messenger pathways get triggered from a single receptor binding, but we're not going to get into that right now. Um, what are other benefits of second messenger pathways? More flexibility because there's more opportunity for different outcomes. Yeah, lots of flexibility. Right, if you go back to our picture again, 
you know, in fact, let's go back to the original picture. If I have a nicotinic cholinergic receptor and it binds acetylcholine, there's only one thing that happens. It opens up a cation channel and my cell is going to depolarize, get more positive as the sodium rushes in. So that is all that this, this is a one trick pony. Nicotinic cholinergic receptor. It's a really useful one trick pony, but it's a one trick pony. It binds acetylcholine and lets cations into the cell. Um, a second messenger pathway. You can have so many different options down here. You can have the same receptor binding a same ligand, but on different cells that are wired up differently. So on one cell, adrenaline might speed up your heart rate. On another cell, adrenaline might turn on enzymes that release glucose into your bloodstream for energy, right? Because it depends if it's a liver cell versus a heart cell. You know, what you want to the response to adrenaline to be is different. So you can have the same receptor end up having very different outcomes if you have different second messenger pathways connected to it. Um, the other thing is you can also have the same outcome with different receptors, right? The same way I talked about converging metabolic pathways. Like if you're a liver cell that has stored carbohydrate, if you see cortisol, stress hormone, or adrenaline, or you see thyroxine, the thyroid hormone, there's lots of different things that all would tell you like, oh, the body should get more sugar right now. Let's turn on the enzyme that releases sugar into the bloodstream. So you can have lots of different receptors that all end up with the same outcome. So like a liver cell that can have different receptors that all converge on the same outcome, which is turning on an enzyme that releases stored carbohydrate to the system, to the body. So if we go back to my little list here, flexibility, we can have like, you know, different receptors can lead to same outcome. Like I said, you can have a liver cell that binds thyroid hormone on one receptor or binds cortisol stress hormone on another receptor. But in both cases, it turns on an enzyme which releases glucose into the bloodstream. Um, you can also have same receptor leads to different outcomes in different cases. Like I said, like adrenaline binding a cell in your heart might just be changing the, you know, the rate of your heartbeat. Adrenaline binding in your liver cells might turn on these enzymes that release sugar into your blood for energy. So you, you know, just because a receptor binds its ligand, what happens next depends on what cell you're looking at and what the second messenger pathway looks like. That, that makes sense? All right, and there's one last thing we usually put on this list of benefits of second messenger pathways. Anybody um, read ahead? Would that be amplification? Yeah, big time amplification. Um, the basic story here is each step has the ability to turn on multiple parts of the next step. So I might have one ligand binding my receptor here. But then this G protein turns on a bunch of adenylocyclases. Each adenylocyclase is making lots of cyclic AMP. Each cyclic AMP is turning on lots of these enzymes and each of these enzymes is phosphorylating lots of its targets. So you get this exponential increase in effect. Um, I have, where is, I have actually a little factoid that I love to read. Let me find it here. Here I have, it says, 
one molecule of epinephrine, that's adrenaline, one molecule of adrenaline can mobilize the release of 10 to the eighth, 100 million molecules of glucose by the liver. So you have one molecule of adrenaline binding a receptor on a liver cell. And through this kind of exponential kind of amplification, you ultimately turn on these enzymes releasing 100 million molecules of glucose into the bloodstream. So, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. You can have a very large effect from a very small initial um, signal here. So does that make sense then? We have lots of opportunities for complex control because there's so many steps in there and you can, you know, different cellular processes can affect those. For instance, like I said, by turning on or off phosphodiesterase, you can make a, make a pathway continue on longer or less. I talked about Viagra doing it as a drug that affects phosphodiesterase, but in a naturally occurring process in the cell, sometimes just another pathway will turn on or off phosphodiesterase and affect a, a second messenger pathway. Um, like I said, flexibility. Different receptors can lead to the same outcome in a cell. You can have the same receptor have many different outcomes depending on the needs of a particular cell because there's lots of different ways to hook it up now, as opposed to that directly gated channel that I showed you where, you know, in the future, like, you know, in another, um, another few weeks, when you see nicotinic cholinergic receptor, you'll just know, always excitatory. If I see a neuron with a nicotinic cholinergic receptor, I know if it binds acetylcholine, it's going to get excited as positive sodium rushes in. If I have these other kinds, like a muscarinic, muscarinic cholinergic receptors, these are these use second messengers. If I have a cell and I have a muscarinic cholinergic receptor that binds acetylcholine and you ask me, what does it do? I would say, I have no idea. You have to tell me which cell you're looking at because it could turn things on, it could turn things off because it depends how the second messenger pathway looks with this second messenger, this G protein mediated receptor. So again, okay, that's gonna be important. Like again, in a few weeks, if you see a muscarinic cholinergic receptor and you wanna know what the result is of binding acetylcholine, you don't know unless you know what cell you're looking at. Whereas if it's a nicotinic cholinergic receptor, you do know it's gonna excite it. So that, that makes sense. Um, So any questions about second messenger pathways as discussed up to this point? Ah, Sienna? Is a phosphodiester doing just the exact contrary of the protein kinase? Um, no, 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 no. Protein kinase phosphorylates things and will turn things on, you know, can adds phosphate groups to things. Right. The phosphodiesterase degrades cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP. Not by taking a phosphorus off of it? Um, you know, I'm not, it, it breaks it apart. I'm not exactly sure of the okay. details of it, but I wouldn't think of it that way. I would think of it just as breaking apart and getting it out of the, out of the system. Okay. So yeah, phosphodiesterase, um, it probably does work by breaking like some phosphodiesterase bond or something, but the reality is I, I just think of it more functionally. It, it um, breaks down phosphodi it breaks down the, the second messenger and makes it inactive. Okay. So 
Yeah, not now, after, probably late after class, I'll double check and see exactly what it does. Um, other questions? You know, we're gonna be seeing second messenger pathways till the very end of the semester. They're gonna be at the core of all sorts of things. When we get to the, get to the endocrine system at the end of the semester, this is how hormones are mediated. Hormones bind receptors and turn on second messenger pathways. Um, you have, you'll have to understand second messenger pathways. So if this isn't making sense and you're thinking, well, luckily we're gonna move on to the systems and we'll get out of this stuff, you know, we, we never get out of this stuff. This is going to be at the core of why the endocrine system works, why the nervous system works. And you need to understand this to understand the more subtle functionings of those. Um, next class, I will show you a little more detail even about what is going on when a receptor binds a ligand and how does that actually activate a G protein? it's actually a very physical thing. It's like, I can give you just a little teaser. Like if this is my cell membrane and the reality, a receptor is this thing with these transmembrane helices. It's got a binding site. It's got a thing with the G protein here. And the reality when a ligand comes in, it's pushing and pulling on all of these alpha helices, these transmembrane helices. It's got hydrogen bonds and ionic bonds. So it's actually, as the ligand comes in, it exerts force on this complicated protein and is actually gonna push and pull and adjust these transmembrane helices of this receptor. This is my receptor here. That's gonna subtly change the shape on this cellular side, and it's gonna catalyze the activation of the G protein. So basically by having the ligand bind here on the outside of the cell, it tweaks the shape of the receptor in such a way that it actually turns on its ability to catalyze the activation of the G protein on the inside of the cell. And then the G protein drifts and turns on the second messenger production and does all that magic. But there's actually a very physical thing happening where a ligand binds the receptor. Actually, there's a conformational change. Conformational meaning the shape changes a bit, and that you know activates ability to you know catalyze um, turning on G protein. So if that makes sense, that's, that's ultimately what ligands binding these, there are other kind. this is a very kind of traditional common kind of receptor. These, they have like, we're gonna see them in more detail. There's seven transmembrane helices that go back, back and forth. There's the exo loops, the parts that are visible to, from outside the cell, the cyto loops, the parts that are visible inside the cell. These are the ones that are interacting with the G protein. These parts of the receptor protein here on the outside are the parts that the ligand sees and can bind with. But because it's one big protein, messing with it on the outside also can change the shape on the inside as things, as these helices shift with respect to each other. And that's what's gonna turn on the G protein. Turning on the G protein could turn on adenylocyclase, make cyclic AMP, which then turns on protein kinase, which then phosphorylates things and maybe opens a channel. So that all, that's all clear, clear? Okay, cool. Um,